for doing this, you really have to think globally. And I think there are two key issues. And the first is the divergence of personal views and national legal requirements about liability, security, traceability, and privacy. And second is how to keep any standards or legislation in this whole area minimal and simple. Um, I'm, I'm expecting someone to give me my next slide now because I'm slightly uh, unable. Um, uh, identity has already been uh, mentioned. And identity is absolutely inextricably bound up with trust. And trust is vital for online payments. Um, everyone, I think, should accept, and I've had so many arguments about this, um, that individuals and businesses and other organizations actually need to be identified and not anonymous when they're doing online payments. Um, we shouldn't be avatars in the online world. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, the thing that we really need are simple ways to ensure that contractual liability um, is clear and understood by all the party when you're doing a payment. Um, and I'd like to consider uh, transactions that an individual or business considers um, either high or low risk. And that's going to vary from person to person, business to business. Um, which of these are people doing now or might they do in a mobile environment? Um, if we consider transactions that an individual or business considers high risk, um, it would be something like purchasing a house or business buying in its stock for, for Christmas. And these are transactions where the purchaser um, has um, a very low tolerance for risk. Uh, so they're going to use trusted intermediaries, lawyers, banks, trusted third parties, who will hold goods and payments in escrow. Uh, in the UK, these transactions almost always involve a bank-to-bank -bank transaction, something like a BACS transaction between the buyer and seller's accounts. And these high-value transactions are unlikely to be done in a mobile environment at the moment. However, with the speed of change, which the previous two speakers have already talked about, that actually could come sooner than we think. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, if we take a low-value transaction, this is where it's really interesting at the moment, um, and you choose to do it on a mobile device, something like buying some goods or paying for a course at a local adult college. These are typically done more and more, particularly by young people, on mobile devices. And in this, you need to pass trust from one system to another. Now, many of you here, and, and I would certainly choose to use a credit card, and that's because with a credit card, we know where the risk lies and we know that we have redress. The risk of failure is covered by the credit card company, by their charges, and the rate uh, of failure grows, the credit card company is, is going to add a new security feature, maybe a device feature like PIN Sentry, or they're going to demand uh, additional security verification checks for the users. Now, when we talk about mobile devices, very few current smartphones have assured approaches to security at the moment. So their transactions are susceptible, or could be susceptible to intercept and lots of other forms of attack. Uh, the multiplicity of secure elements um, in mobiles and the lack of any accepted standards in secure elements leads, I think, to enormous concerns about how secure a device, uh, how to secure a device against uh, what criteria um, and how to assess their integrity. It's unclear if this current fragility in mobile uh, security poses potential catastrophic failures in mobile payments or an accumulation of slow burn failures, uh, where small amounts of money will keep on leaking from, from the system. If it's the latter, um, I, I think that's more likely, um, there'll be growing awareness of risk and people will adjust their behaviors. This has already happened in things like uh, transport, food safety, pharmaceuticals. <coughs> Customers will become cannier, suppliers will improve systems, and governments will regulate only to improve, um, uh, to bring about improvements if people don't move fast enough and to deal with the stragglers in improving security. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this isn't the only chain of liability, but we need to think about the chain of liability in a mobile payment. 
Mobile access services offer convenience to impatient users, um, but the redress and liability are the real issues. Um, now, if you think about the liability and redress chain for purely card-based mobile uh, transactions, that's quite clear. The card issue, issuer remains liable for lost payments. Um, but the liability chain for a smartphone-based mass transaction using sections of links codes from lots of different providers provides real obvious difficulties in apportioning liability. And at the moment, this is really completely opaque. Banks, credit card companies, mobile device manufacturers, and network operators are, are all involved at the moment in developing business models for mobile access services and in reducing these security risks. It's not clear uh, what, if any, role government is going to have or regulators in ensuring that mass offers uh, safe and secure services to consumers. And until case law, based on experience, um, has built up um, uh, against losses that have been established, um, this is not going to be clear, and these liability chains are going to change. If you think of handling a payment on a PC, um, again, your liability is quite clear because you're channeled through one device and one portal. Um, but when you're using a mobile device, um, the, who, who owns that liability is very unclear, and particularly, as we've already heard, the more and more apps there are. Does the app developer have liabilities? That really isn't, isn't clear. Um, often the only real security in low-value mobile transactions um, is the limit on the purchase value that you've put on your mobile wallet, the amount of money you've put in, or the limit that's been set by one of the many, many people in this transaction train on uh, the amount of money that they're going to allow you to put at risk. So lack of standards in mobile access services means that mobile apps can be developed to an enormous number of different interface specifications. And few of these are likely to be secure. And the users are very unlikely to know uh, which apps are swapping data which, with which other apps. And that, again, is frequently happening. So standards are really important in guaranteeing these interactions. But given, as you all know here, it can often take more than three years to develop a standard, there are going to be umpteen developments in um, the uh, mobile access services in the devices you're using and the apps in that time. So you're always going to be playing uh, a stupid game of catch-up. If we're going to look at mobile transactions as the new norm for payments, um, it gives you a completely different perspective on what should happen. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, to see the future, I don't need to tell people in this room, I'm sure, um, about Mpesa. And PESA is a form of mobile money now used by 75% of Kenyans. It's actually estimated uh, that half the country's GDP flows through Mpesa. Money is sent from phone to phone using simple text messaging. And in poor countries where people earn less than a dollar a day, a dollar is an inconveniently large amount of money for either buying vegetables or sending some money home to your family. Uh, a dollar paid to an agent for a mobile um, phone company, turned into mobile money, and divided up works really, really well. It extends financial services to the unbanked rather than bringing banks to um, uh, the unbanked. So the acti activities of Mpesa and similar devices are spawning a lot of new financial services, um, from microcredit to remittances. But at present, they completely lack a single worldwide open source infrastructure to support them. If open standards existed, um, it could make low-value global e-commerce transactions really viable. It could make purchases from and payments to SMEs and startups really simple and feasible. It could cover all the Mpesa type transactions and such things as peer-to-peer -peer sharing of a meal. Um, irrespective of whose mobile account the participants subscribe to. In other words, it could be the future of mobile access service for payments globally. Next slide, please. One thing that could help bring this about um, is a revolution 
in the security standards, as I've said. The World Wide Web Consortium um, have initiated uh, to build an open standard for identity and payments. Um, the requirement specification is being devised now, and I would actually urge all of you uh, to look at this and get involved, as BCS are doing. If you go to the W3C site, you can learn more, and you can, as I say, become involved in this, make your voice heard. The key things are present, uh, that it will be royalty-free um, for work with web architecture, it'll be a decentralized ID with a secure digital signature and web um, key encryption. Last slide, please. So to conclude, <clears throat> I think we should accept that any financial transaction in the physical or online world, there's a chance of being cheated. We need to start online with simple systems that work. Mobile access services will be key element in the future of payments. 100% security simply isn't possible, never will be. So you have to balance usability with security and to consider the risks involved in every transaction. In the physical world, most of us know how to get redress if we're cheated. We know the consumer rights that we have in our home country. In the online world, um, we can face much, much more uncertainty. <coughs> Standards and simple trust models are needed uh, to reduce that uncertainty and extend online payments uh, safely to all people everywhere, banked or unbanked. The focus for all transactions involving online payments needs to be on building trust between parties and ensuring that contractual liabilities are clear and the means of redress are effective. Thank you. Mm -hmm.